How you doing, Sarah? I hope you're not wanting to. I hope you're not wanting to learn very much. <laughs> Kevin McFarlane, how you doing, buddy? Give people some time to jump on here, guys. Doug Lamb, good to see you, bud. Thanks for the text earlier. Good deal, Kevin. We'll be seeing you here in Ohio in what, another week and a half or so. You guys hear me all right out there? Clint, good to see you on here. I'm having a great day now, but it's been busy. Uh, he's just having three days be in between shows is killing me. Appreciate that, Travis. Man, Doug, I hate to hear that, bud. That COVID stuff, that, it's no joke to mess around with. Hope you're doing good. Says you're making plot planes. He must be doing pretty good. <clears throat> Mark, I appreciate it, bud. I'm trying to figure out something that's nice and easy here for this show and, and uh, kind of just turned out what you see right here. So it worked out really well. And if I'm ever running short on product, I'll just come in and snag some. So. Thanks, Floyd. I appreciate it, bud. Yeah, I know, it, Doug, it was a good show. We had a really, really good show. Last two shows, the Indianapolis show was awesome. The Iowa show was off the chart. Uh, I have never, I'll just put it this way. We made more money on Friday than I have doing all three days of every show I've ever done. It, it was ridiculous. I've never seen it like that. Thanks to all of our loyal customers out there. I mean, they just blew it out of the park this year. I mean, it was old Scuba Steve, which he'll probably be on here a little bit. He helped me load the truck up. We didn't have nothing to load up. I mean, they bought me out Friday, Saturday. I was out of almost everything. I just cannot believe that show. There's old Scuba. I was just talking about you, buddy. Gregory, good to see you on here, bud. Anthony, I'll be seeing you here in about a week and a half, too. Make sure you bring that sleeping machine, Dill, so I don't have to hear you snoring in the hotel room, buddy. All right, guys, let's fire this thing off here. Well, as you can tell, this is an all-new show. Uh, something that I've been wanting to do for a while, or thirsting for uh, Knowledge Thursdays. Went over very well, but you know, I, it just seemed like it was missing something. Uh, I was bouncing around from hotel to hotel during the show season, having to do these shows actually in uh, in the hotel room, trying to find Wi-Fi half time that was good enough to do them. Uh, it, it just really, really bummed me out on a lot of them. Uh, but we did have some good success with it. A lot of new customers, uh, a lot of old customers chiming in all the time. So that's the reason I switched it to Tuesdays. As you guys, most of you know right now, I'm on the, I'm on the show circuit right now. Uh, I'm getting home either Sunday night or Monday morning early, and then I'm leaving back out Thursday morning about 3 to 4 o'clock every morning on, on Thursdays. Then head to the next one, one right after another every week uh, until the middle of April. 
So I switched it to Tuesday night. I hope it's all right with all you guys. Uh, I just knew that I would be home. I could put something together like I did here and uh, be more presentable and, and just be a lot better atmosphere here. And I, I don't have to worry about things. So really the only thing I got to worry about here is that we have storms. The Wi-Fi has an issue with a bad storm tonight. Nice and peaceful out. So I hope it stays that way. Um, but again, um, it's just it's just something I've been wanting to do. And I'm still wanting the questions, guys. I mean, I got a topic for every show, and you'll see that when we promote it each, each every other week, actually. But I want you guys asking the questions. I mean, if you got a question, it don't even have to be about the topic we're talking about that night. Just ask me the question, and we'll get through it. Uh, that's what I'm really here for. But I'd like to throw something in there every time just to give us something to start off with, and then we'll take off of the Q&A. So as you all know, if I can't think of the answer, I'll make one up. So I'll make it good. But, you know, we're right in the middle of, most of the Midwest is right in the middle of uh, frost season right now. And a lot of people ask me all the time, is it too early? Is it too late? You know, when it comes to your clovers, your alfalfa, stuff like that, there's really no right time. I mean, yes, when you're wanting to frost seed, you want to you want to find them nights when, you know, you're getting in this time of year where you're freezing at night, you're thawing during the day. That's how that seed's getting sucked in. That's what you're looking for. But a lot, of, you know, how our weather is going crazy here lately, you know, it was 30 degrees this morning, today it was 67 degrees yesterday. You know, it's just crazy what this weather is doing. All next week's gonna be a cold spell. Uh, before I took off on the road, I did frost seed all my clovers that need to be frost seeded this year. Not all of them did, but the ones that needed it, got it uh, last Wednesday after I loaded my truck. And uh, and I did it in six degree weather. Now we got this cool spell coming in. That seed guys will lay there dormant. You do not have to worry about that seed. You can do it as early as you want, but there's no reason to do it like that. Wait till you're getting closer to the spring green up. You can go right out there. You don't have to call it frost seed and call it overseed. You know, just go out there and overseed your clover plots. Then little seeds are going to find every little crack and crevice. The moisture is still going to suck them down and you're going to have a great, great stand of clover. So, you know, I have no issues at all, especially with our trophy clover or game changer clover. No issues at all. Booner buffet, no issues at all. Uh, the only issue you have with Booner buffet is it does have alfalfa. So, you know, you do not want to try to plant alfalfa on top of alfalfa. It just will not grow. So, uh, but the clovers, no issues at all, or a new standing of Booner Buffet with the alfalfa, no issue. So just get out there and frost seed, overseed, whichever one you want to call it, whatever your temperatures are allowing you to do right now. I mean, you can go all the way up into, you know, middle of May, June, if you wanted to. And just overseed them plots. Them little seeds are gonna get in every crack and crevice. So don't don't sweat it thinking that you're way too late. You're not gonna be able to get them in. Uh, it's gonna be just fine. So, but the number one topic I want to talk about tonight is actually testing your soil. That pH test kit right there. You know we make them quick, easy. Do it in your plot. $14.99 retail does four plots. You can't, you can't beat the price. You can't beat the results you get out of it. You'll know before you walk away from your plot exactly how much lime you need per acre within 20 minutes. And in that 20 minutes, I'm talking is actually going out, taking your soil samples, mixing them together, getting eight ounces of soil, eight ounces of distilled water, stir them together, wait 10 minutes, dip your strip in, you're going to have your results. So, and a lot of people don't realize, you know, I'll just pull these apart right here. Everything I'm telling you about this pH kit, when you buy one, everything is right here in black and white in color. You know, all instructions, it's going to tell you how much fertilizer you need uh, per acre to get up to the desired amount that you want. Uh, it's going to tell you how much fertilizer you're actually wasting by what your pH is if it's not at a 7.0 neutral state. So very, very, you know, it's it's the most important step that you can do for your soil and for your food plot. 
It's the easiest step, the cheapest step, and it's the number one step most people do not do because they don't want to take the time to do it. That little plot, that little kit right there and some lime is going to make or break your plot. A lot of people look at a plot and they won't test their, their pH. Been there, done it in my younger years. You know, didn't know nothing about it. Didn't have nobody teach me anything about it. Uh, I would go in, I'd plant, uh, let's say prior to Antler King days back in, oh, that's been 25 years ago. Uh, before I've been planting Antler King for, what, 25 years this year. So prior to that, you know, I didn't know anything about planting food plots. I was going into the co-ops and just get me a pound of clovers, all different varieties. Didn't know nothing about them. I didn't know the difference between warm season, cool season. I didn't know about, you know, nothing. Annuals, perennials, mix them together, throw them out there. And they grew up about that big. And I thought I had the picture perfect plot that you could put on any catalog there ever was. Until I met the guys at Antler King at the Illinois Deer and Turkey Classic 25 years ago. And I just happened to stop by their booth. They taught me about the pH. They taught me about why my clovers are doing what they're doing. After they told me they were actually sending themselves out, that's why they're not growing big. I thought they were beautiful. Uh, that's when my love for the trophy clover, that's when it started 25 years ago. So planted one bag of that and I've planned it ever since. One of my plots this year actually is 19 years old and uh, I frost seeded every three years and at 19 years old. Shot a lot of deer over that trophy clover plot, but it's because of testing your pH. You have to test that pH. You have to get that soil up, uh, that pH up in that soil. You know, even if you can get it to a 6.0, you're still losing some uh, nutrients there. It's not going to be able to intake all the nutrients, 100% of what you're giving it, but it's going to do good. So if you can get it in that 6.0 to 7.0, you're doing good. But man, while you're at it, get it as close to 7.0 as you can. So... And that's going to help you no matter if it's perennials, if it's annuals this fall. Right now is the perfect time. Literally, truthfully, if you was actually wanting to build your soil, you should have already had your lime down for these spring plantings already. Because you're looking at pelletized lime taking about three months to break down, ag lime taking about six months. So I always spread my lime, do my soil tests and spread my lime during the winter. So it'll be breaking down and getting where I want it to be come planting season. So, um, it's just something you need to do. You know, lime is cheap. It's easy to put down. Now, don't get me wrong. Ag lime is a pain. It's dusty. It's nasty. That's why I like going to pelleted. Plus, it breaks down quicker. But uh, it's. I, I just wish more people would actually test their soil. And I know I sound like I'm beating a dead horse here, and I'm not trying to. But it's something that I push and I push. And I'll, I'll tell you what I've done. Well, we've done four shows this year already, two selling shows. The two selling shows, I have sold out of pH kits by Saturday. And I'm so happy with that. But I push them. And a lot of people have no clue what the pH is in their soil. They have no idea what the pH even means. And they really don't know what it does. So getting that pH in that soil build up and getting it close to that 7.0, you're actually going to allow that plant to utilize 100% of the fertilizer that you put down and the nutrients stored into the soil that it needs. You start dropping down lower and lower, you get down, you're getting down to where your plants can only, let's say a 5.5 uh, pH, you know, you can get in that 25, 35% is all they can utilize. So all that money you're putting in fertilizer is just a waste. It's just money thrown down the drain. It's gonna sit there, the plants cannot utilize it. So you need to get that pH put up. And that's the number one thing I hear mostly when people uh, ask about, their pH, they have, they have flat tell me, I don't check it. I just put a whole bunch more fertilizer down. Well, the money they spent on that extra fertilizer could have fixed the soil in their plot. So check that pH, get it up. And you guys know me well enough. You can get on, email me, phone call, text message, message me on Facebook. You know I'll help you get through it. Uh, I've done a lot of it where people actually do an instant messenger uh, video, phone call video, or they they will uh, uh, call me right when they're middle of plots while they're trying to do it and want me to help them out. That's what I'm here for, guys. I'll help you in any way I can. Seeing here that uh, Bradley Farmer, he's asking where he can order. I think these guys are already talking to him, but I will throw it out there. Uh, www.antlerking.com. We're free shipping, always free shipping. Get on there, 
order it straight from us, free shipping, it comes straight to your door. So there is some stores that carry it, not a lot. These are just little kits that a lot of places just don't want to carry. And the number one reason is, is there are so many different pH test kits out there uh, in the gardening section that they already have so many SKUs for pH test kits that are different. You either got to send them in, some are probes. I'm not a real big fan of the probes. I've actually done some testing side by side with them. Uh, and some are close, some are not. So uh, they just don't want to carry them extra SKUs, but some stores will carry them. So you can always look there and they're usually hanging right there by the food plot seat. But like I said, I used to be one of them that never tested it and didn't, well, I didn't know nothing about it. Truthfully, guys, I, I didn't know a thing. When I started in the food plots, I had no clue what I was doing. Um, nobody in the area was doing it. You know, I mean, this was before all the big, you got to kill big deer. You got to, uh, you got to put minerals out. Didn't know what minerals were. Didn't know anything. All I knew is I was trying to hunt on a cornfield or bean field somewhere that a farmer had. That's all I looked for. And, uh, and I've had a few farmers help me and they, they got me started a little bit, but again, there's a lot more to it. And then the other way, there's really not. So, uh, the main thing when it comes to these clovers guys, and I know I want to talk about preparing soil and stuff like that, but let, let me really push when you're, when you're working with these clovers, especially, you know, your trophy clover, game changer clover, Booner buffet, you have to, you have to maintain these plots. I mean, just getting them out there, letting them grow up, they look great. And then people wonder why after a while the deer aren't hitting them as much. They need maintained. Then plants mature out, they get stemmy, they're not as palatable for the deer to eat. They're at the lowest protein level. You got to cut them plots, take the tops off of them, leave them six to eight inches high. Uh, it's something that you definitely have to do. You know, there's selective herbicides you can spray on them to kill the grasses and weeds out of them which will really make them, them uh, plots flourish really well. So the maintaining is a big key part. And, uh, and I have got, excuse me, I have guys that will actually, they're so into it. I have one guy that I talk to regularly that I turned on the trophy clover that he weed wax a half acre plot. And last year, I think he did it eight times, taking the tops off of it. And he just can't believe the difference he, he gets. And, uh, that's dedication right there. I love hearing them stories. I love seeing the pictures he sends and shows me what's going on. And he's wearing that old steel weed eater out. I'm telling you that right now. But, uh, well, here, here we got one right here. Tra Travis is asking, uh, what is my opinion on liquid calcium? I never talk negative about another company's products. I'm just going to give you the facts of my testing. I have done a lot of research on liquid calcium a lot because again i want my plots to be right if i can benefit by using a different uh product compared to my granular uh, my granular lime my pelleted lime i would be more than happy to try it um uh, i started getting a lot of people start getting a hold of me and asking me man we're we're using this certain this certain product this liquid calcium and the, the plants within days are green as a gourd. This stuff works. You need to buy it. You guys need to carry it. So I started researching the companies and I started finding that 99% of them had a pretty good dosage of nitrogen mixed in with them. Nitrogen is going to turn them plants green as a gourd. Nitrogen ain't going to do nothing for your soil. But here's my, here's the real study I have. I've talked to probably more farmers I can count on both my hands. And I've asked them about liquid calcium. Every single one of them pretty much told me if it worked like they say it will, we'd all be spraying it. And we don't know one farmer that sprays it. So, cause it would be a big savings, a monstrous savings for a farmer. If they could, if they could use that liquid, if, if the liquid calcium worked like it's supposed to. And I don't know one, that will use it. I'm going to leave that there. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying nothing negative about anybody's product. Uh, not calling anybody out. I never will. But I just don't use it. I, I'll stick to my old trusty, my pelleted lime. It's worked for 25 years and it'll continue to work till the day I plant my last plot. So 
That's the way I'm going to do it. So, but back to clovers. You know, clovers, you know me. Everybody calls me the, the clover king. I guess I've been called worse. Um, that is just a mix, the trophy clover. I tell everybody, if Antler King fired me tomorrow, the next day, I would buy trophy clover, I'd buy trophy deer mineral, I'd buy clover fuel, honey hole and slam dunk would be coming home with me, and I'd plant them every year. That's how much, and the other ones are good, they're great. Them are my babies. Not only trophy clover, uh, but it is my favorite. I want a food plot that is going to give my deer 12 months of food. Uh, that's what I want. The trophy clover would do it. You know, cool season seed. It's got the chicory mixed in, four different varieties of clover. Uh, again, I got one plot that's 19 years old this year. I kill deer off of it every year. My daughter kills deer off of it. We have a blast watching deer in it. Um, I sent my buddy photos today. It's greening up like a gourd right now, as it has been, but it's really green now. And I can't tell you how many deer were in this picture. It was it was ridiculous. And uh, uh, his comment actually was, I need to get a machine gun to thin them out. Uh, that was his comment. But that's just why I like it so much. It's going to give them deer the protein they need, easily digestible. Um, and one of my favorite things about it is I enjoy being in the woods and building plots, working on plots, maintaining plots, spraying plots. I would rather do that than shoot deer anymore. So that trophy clover actually gives me a job throughout the summer where I can spend time out in my property and, and making a difference. And not only for the property, uh, but for the deer or self and the animals. Uh, and a couple of groundhogs I need to get rid of right now. So we'll talk about them at a different time. But hopefully I get trophy pictures one of these days of leave them. Kip Campbell took care of a couple of them for me, or one of them for me. I need to take care of a couple more. But uh, we need... We need to get more people out there involved in planting perennial plots because the benefit the deer receive from a, a good legume plot, a good high protein food source is unbelievable, especially in the growing season. Now, don't get me wrong. The honey hole, slam dunk, grade eight, all them like that, the high energy plants uh, mixes there. We got to have them too for fall plantings. We got to have them for after that rut and deer have to build that body back up. Uh, they got to get to 100% before the spring of next year, or they'll never be able to grow to their fullest potential. So, in places where you can, uh, you can bait, you can, you can supplemental feed stuff like that. The Graniac block, wherever I got it, is by far the best block ever on the market. And I know that sounds biased, but I'm going to tell you right now, it is the best block on the market. And the only negative thing about that block, and it's the biggest sales pitch ever said. The deer like it way too much. And for anybody that uses it, they know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's an unbelievable product. But let's get back to the soil. You know, so we're talking about the pH. Getting that pH up. Really what you're looking at here next is let's get into working some soil. Now, for the ones of you that have the equipment where you can either till, you can disc, uh, you can harrow, drag, you know, whatever you have or cultivate, whatever you have. If you have not put your fertilizer and lime on already, excuse me, uh, this is a great time to do it. Get it on there, work it into the soil as you till it under. It's gonna break, it's gonna make that breakdown process a lot faster. You're not gonna lose as much nitrogen because that nitrogen fertilizer, uh, saying for like your annual plots, not so much your clovers, you don't want that nitrogen on there. But for the, the annual plots, Long as that, uh, as long as that nitrogen is sitting on the ground and that granular nitrogen, it's going to start evaporating. You're going to lose a lot of it. So you want to work it in. Let let it let it feed into the soil. So work that up and underneath. Uh, again, it's best to get that that line put on way before. I mean months ahead of time. But if you can't, it's a good time to do it now when you're going to till that plot. But one of the biggest things I have noticed, and you've heard me say it many a times, when it comes to working ground and, uh, you know, turning dirt, and I guess that's how I, maybe that's where I got the name from, 
uh, you're looking at a lot of people are going to tillers. A tiller can hurt a food plot really, really bad if you don't know what you're doing. The number one thing, you never want to look at a food plot as your garden. You never want to work that soil up like you do your garden. Uh, a lot of times that garden, you're getting down six, eight inches. You're, you're really working it up real good, turning it to powder. You're in there walking and, and planting your seeds by hand, where when it comes to a food plot, you only need that top couple inches worked. And that's where a disc comes in really nice. And a tiller does too. Set your three point where that's only going to let that go and set the, the outriggers on your, your tiller down where it's only going to go a couple inches and just go over it. If you want to turn it to powder there, you can, but you better have a call to packer or something to be able to pack the soil. Because the number one thing you need to do prior to seeding, after tilling or disking, heroin, whatever, you need to compact that soil. You know, you guys see me beat Packer Max to death on a food plot. I beat that poor thing as much as I can. Uh, I blew tires out in it last year. I used it so much. Uh, willing it from one plot to the other behind the three-wheeler. Loaded. I mean, I was I, I put it through the test. And that thing is the best thing I've ever seen. Here I am talking about Packer Max. I'm not sponsored by Packer Max. I don't get it from Packer Max. I love the product. It works for what I want it for. If you want one, go check them out. If you'd rather have a big old heavy thing that like I have while on the farm right now, I got 10 footers, I got 12 footers. Uh, they're just too big and awkward for me for my small food plots. So that's why you always see me promoting the Packer Max because I found a product just like the Trophy Clover that works, I promote it. So I don't have to get nothing out of it to promote it. I do it to help you guys out. And if I think it's gonna help you, I'm gonna help you. So. But pack that soil, compact it, then seed it and compact it again. Now, if you're getting into more of, let's say, the, the red zone or soybean blend, you're going to have peas soy, uh, and soybeans in it. You kind of play with it a little bit because you can actually, if you can just scuff up that top layer, give it a nice little inch seed bit or so, and then go in there and broadcast the seed and run that cola pack over at one time, you're usually pretty good. You just don't want to get very deep with that, that, that work in that soil. Because packing the soil and then putting peas on top and then packing it again, a lot of them peas, you won't get deep enough. You'll get some germination out of them, but you won't get them deep enough as what you need to get them deep. So when the, with the bigger seeds like that, real fine seed bed, go over and broadcast your seed one time, run over the packer, be done. So, but all the other seeds really, I, I really compact mine, and I mean, when I compact it, I'll go over four or five times. I want it good, and, and this as firm as this table is right here. So when I lay that seed down, them grooves in that Packer Max is going to push that seed in just where I want them, and it's going to work out perfect. And uh, that's why the plots turn out the way they do, because I take the extra time to do it. Uh, so, yeah, get, getting in there with that, you cannot be a call to Packer. Uh, if you don't have one, roller. Uh, if you don't have a roller, if you got a four wheeler, most people have four wheelers these days. Or if you're uh, an old timer like me, I wouldn't get rid of my three wheeler for a four wheeler, so I'd use a three wheeler. But you can use your four wheeler to go out, tire track it in. Go out there and work your soil, tire track it in. Use your tractor, tire track it in, and then go seed over it and do it. Because if you ever look, let's just say that, and here's what I'm getting at with tilling, guys. I see it all the time. People will run a tiller and they'll run it eight inches deep. And then they go and broadcast their seed. And then they go drive their tractor over it to pull a cola packer over it before packing it first. They will till, they will till it, they will seed it, and then they will go drive a tractor over it and pull their cola packer. Well, that 5,000 pound tractor on four wheels just leaves ruts that deep as it goes through. And you can tell it behind the cola packer, here's these ruts. All them seeds that they're hitting is pushing way too deep. You know, never get germination. That's why you see big strips in them plots because the seeds are way too deep because the tire tracks push them down too far. The cola packer is going to push a lot of them down too far because that's just way too fine and that cola packer is way too heavy and that dirt's just fluff. So good firm seed bed, broadcast your seed, pack it again and pray, pray and pray and pray to Mother Nature that we get some rain that we didn't get last year. And, uh, I'll tell you what, last worst plots I ever had in 25 years was last year. It was, I never seen a drought like that. 
But another thing I see a lot of people doing, and I want to touch on it. I get a lot of questions about it. I get asked, asked it a lot. And that is watering your plant, your plot, especially after seeding. You know, if that plant is up and growing and you get a drought and you want to water it some, fine. But like last year, I planted our new Southern Greens and uh, pretty much for another test, two years for a test. And I planned it in August. I think it was like the 7th of August. I didn't get a drop of rain. No, I take that back. It was the 15th of August. I didn't get a drop of rain, not even a tenth of an inch of rain till October 7th. That plot was dead. I mean, I mean, I shouldn't say dead. That plot was nothing there. What was dead on it was the weeds and everything that did germinate and start growing. It got so dry, they died. So here's dead weeds all over and grasses all over this plot. Our bow season starts October 1st. I'll never forget sitting in a tree stand, just disgusted looking at that plot, just brown and nasty. We finally got the rain on the 7th. Within two weeks, that Southern Greens exploded. And here's this green carpet showed up and it started growing. And it was one of my most beautiful plots I had. The deer completely wiped it out. I'm planting twice as much of it this year. I could not believe what them collard greens did. It was, it was unbelievable. But what I'm getting at, just because it doesn't rain, don't think them seeds are bad. You know, what you have an issue with is if you get the rain and they pop up this tall and they, you get a drought for two months or so, they lay over and die, then replant. But if, them, if they have not germinated yet, and you didn't get the rain that you thought you were going to get when you planted, don't be spraying water on it. I mean, unless you can dump the, the amount, you're looking at 30, what, 34,000 gallons of water per acre to, the, to equal an inch of rain. And that's what you need per acre. So unless you can do that, just leave it alone. Let Mother Nature take it. She's cruel, but usually in the, at the end, the outcome's pretty good. But watering a plot to try to get it to germinate is the worst thing on that plot because a lot of times you don't put enough water on you put just enough to get that plant to start its germination process and either you don't continue or you don't put enough on and then that's going to let that that seed that is starting to germinate just lay there and rot and then it never will so then then you are come if, I, if i'd have done that come october 7th when we got that rain i'd have never had any growth at all if I had to try water it with just a little water here and there. All right, guys, I got all kinds of stuff on here. Let me see what kind of questions we have. I know my pro staffers are probably on here talking to everybody, but I want to find out what's going on here. Hope you guys are having a good night, man. It's, it was beautiful yesterday, but man, did it get cold today. Dustin Gaskill, good to, good to see you on here, bud. Love that shed the boy found, man. Loved it. Don, good to see you on here. Clint wanting to hold up the sheds. Oh, same side, same deer. One year apart. Obviously, you know, it's not the same year. Or I'd have a pretty special deer. Yeah, they're big old boys. Scuba Steve, you're right. Iowa kicked butt this year, man. It was an awesome show. I appreciate you and Jason for all the help. Travis, I will be at the Wisconsin Classic at the Dells at the Kalahari. I will be there. Uh, I got Kansas this weekend. I'm taking off for Kansas in two days. Uh, then I got Ohio and then Wisconsin and then Illinois. So, yep, I'll, I'll always be at that Wisconsin show. That's our home state, buddy. That's that's a good one. I hope they're buying this light. Usually that's my number one selling state. They're going to have to do some work to beat Iowa. 
Anthony, you better bring some earplugs. I know I am. Just in case I forget them, make sure you bring me some. Old Keaton's on here, my old buddy Keaton. For a minute. <clears throat> Red Cedar Works, man. You can't beat old Keaton's work. The bases, oh, he built me a table. I got bases in here. The guy is not only a stand up man, probably one of the nicest guys I ever met. And uh, he does unbelievable work. And he always calls me boss, too. I kind of like that. I'm, I, I, he's a big old boy, so I'm not going to tell him not to. I, I kind of like him calling me boss. And he calls me a legend every once in a while. It really gets my ego going. So, Don, I'm, I'm, Wisconsin is the closest Michigan I'm going to be, bud. Uh, used to do a Michigan show there uh, prior to COVID. Uh, then when COVID hit, it kind of threw everything for a whack and... Uh, Actually, the, the year they shut everything down for COVID, I was 20 minutes from pulling into the Coliseum there, uh, and they turned me around. They called and turned me around, so they shut it down. Mark Coleman's asking when the best time to plant chicory. I frost seed and overseed a lot of my chicory. I'll frost seed it early uh, when I got them cool, them uh, freezing nights, thawing days. I'll, I'll plant a lot of it. Then I will wait and get into that. Oh, usually here in Illinois where I'm at, kind of central Illinois, east central. I'm getting into that turkey season, April, first part of May. Everything's starting to green up. We're getting some rains coming in. I'll get in and overseed that way too. I love it. And then you can just go ahead and plant it normal too. You can wait till Mother Nature allows you to work the ground and you can plant it just like that. So, and I do quite a bit of that too. I, I, use, uh, I use my trophy clover and my game changer and some chicory in certain areas for rotation plots for my honey hole, my slam dunk, my grade eight, and even my collard greens now. So uh, I really like using them just because of the nitrogen they pull uh, that will really feed them annuals. So I'll run them for a couple of years and switch them over to some annual mixes like the honey hole and stuff. And uh, it saves in the fertilizer cost and it feeds the deer at the same time. So that's why I like doing it. And the turnips, radishes, brassicas, they will destroy the soil if you don't. So they will literally destroy it within three years. There's nothing left inside of it. Scuba Steve, I couldn't remember if we sold out of the test kits before Saturday or not, but I knew it was somewhere there. We sold out of them. I did it, I did it at the indie show too. I love seeing that. I love seeing them test kits go and the guys calling me asking for help because that means they're doing it and it's going to benefit them and the deer. So Mark's asking what the shelf life is of the pH kit. No shelf life as long as you can keep it out of moisture. You don't want to store it in an area where it's going to draw moisture, just like you don't want to uh, leave your seeds or anything like that in anywhere it's going to draw moisture. So they're good to go. Brian's saying you don't want his bucks to get that big, otherwise the neighbors will shoot all his deer. I understand that, but I, I got neighbors like that too. They love me planting food plots and stuff. Oh, Cody Jarrett's on here. No whitetail freaks himself, I tell you. He told me he was going to be on here. I just thought I just thought he's pulling my leg. He didn't want to hurt my feelings, but I'm glad to see him on here. Uh, Bradley from uh, from Alabama. How many soil samples? Well, it test. We have more than one one kind of different soil. It, it's gonna it's gonna test it all. We're testing sandy soil, clay, black soil. One kit's gonna do four different plots. One thing I will tell you guys, kind of go back on the soil testing. I guess I should have brought it up. You know, if this table here was the plot, I'm taking soil samples from all four corners of my plot, no matter how big it is, and one right dead in the center, putting them in a two gallon bucket, mixing them all up, and using an eight ounce sample out of it. Try to get it equal around that that plot. So that's that's how I do mine. But yeah, it's going to test all different types of soil: sandy, real loamy soil, uh, black. It, it, it's doing it all. Let 
see my old pro staffers on here doing their job. They're answering a bunch of questions. Guys, I appreciate it. I know I may be answering some questions you guys already have, but some of the guys might not be reading these and and uh, good to let them know. Yeah, Brian, I'll tell you what, that bird's foot is very good. The deer love it. They absolutely do. Uh, we've tested quite a bit of that and, and some different varieties of it. Uh, very, very good. So I can see where that three acres of it did very good for you back in the day. Doug Lamb's asking, uh, coming from a farmer, <laughs> When, when should you start putting on plot max or jolt? Plot max is a soil conditioner. And man, I kind of like having this stuff right here where I can just reach and grab. I did a pretty good job, but it's a soil conditioner. A lot of people think it's a so-called liquid calcium. It is not, it's humic acid. Uh, it is there to break down the soil and and doing so, it's going to allow the nutrients that are stored in that soil uh, to get to that root system quicker. The, the plants will intake them in a lot quicker. So that's what it's designed for. Will it spike the pH a little bit? A very little bit, but not long lived. Use, the, use, your, use your lime to get that pH up. Uh, but it is a soil conditioner. I personally, I, I spray twi uh, twice a growing season on whatever I'm planting. So I'm, I'm spraying, let's say a new plot, I'm spraying prior to planting. A lot of times I'll spray, uh, it, if it needs to be killed off, if the area is nasty, needs to be killed off, where I can actually disc in all the, the, that organic matter into the soil, I will mix it in with all three of our products you can mix right in with your Roundup. So your glyphosate, mix it in with it. So it's a one pass application. So I'll mix it in with my Roundup. I'll spray and kill my plot off. That's my one dose. Then I'll wait for them plants to get three to four inches tall. I'll hit it again. And at the same time, I'm going to be mixing in, depending on what I'm using, if I'm on my clovers, my legumes, I'm using my clover fuel and my plot max mixed together in one tank. If I'm doing my annual mixes, I'm mixing in my jolt and my plot max after that, after that gets up about three inches, uh, three to four inches. So now for the annual ones, like I say, Jolt Plot Max, uh, and then that Jolt, I will spray it again to make my second application of the Jolt because that would make the second application of Plot Max. The second one for the Jolt, I'm going to spray it. Oh, usually I'm getting in there into August or so here in the Midwest. I'm, I mean, you cannot overspray it. It is a nitrogen base, the, the Jolt is, but it's not going to burn the plants like you can with, with fertilizer, uh, with, a high, with a high nitrogen fertilizer. The clover fuel you cannot burn. There's no nitrogen in it. It's a 0028. But I, like I said, I'm doing two applications. Now, my clover fuel, I will religiously spray clover fuel every time I mow my plot. So every time I mow my plot, I'm spraying clover fuel to give that plant a big boost. So anytime you cut that, or anytime I spray spray uh, herbicides, as in my clethodem for grass control my 2,4-DB for broadleaf control. I'm mixing in clover fuel because I know it's going to stun that plant. Even though it's not going to kill it, it's going to stun it a little bit. So I'm going to mix it in with there, and that's actually going to help that plant bounce back faster. So the clover fuel, there could be times I'll spray in a good rainy season. I'll spray 10 to 12 times of clover fuel because I'm mowing that much. Uh, but in a drought type situation like we just had last year, maybe, maybe four times. But yeah. At least we recommend two springs. So, Brian from Medford, Wisconsin. I appreciate you being on here, bud. Cody Jarrett, well, that's a lot of money wasted. He must be thinking about fertilizer and not testing your pH. Exactly right, bud.
Mark, you're asking why uh, why Antler King doesn't sell lime. Uh, uh, nobody would buy it because of the shipping. The shipping would be crazy. And, you know, we're, we're free shipping online. And we'd have to mark it up so much. It, it, it is, it's hard enough to sell a 40-pound bag of feed. And when you're looking at 40 to 60 to 80-pound bags of of lime trying to sell them and a lot of guys are going to need you know four five six seven hundred pounds uh it's just so easy to go to your local co-op your rural king's fleet farm stuff like that used to buy it for a couple bucks a bag now it's a little over four dollars a bag uh i just bought a pallet two weeks ago i think it was and i finally got real keen to give me a break and got it down to like 380 a bag but i had to buy the whole pallet to do it uh but i need it so yeah, it's just hard to sell something like that uh, online sales with shipping as high as shipping is right now. It is ridiculous. Now, that just kind of concerns me. My, my best buddy, old Cody Jared on here, tell me he's terrible at testing soil. Same as we test them once every three years. I, I, he sold his Illinois farm, so I guess I can't go down and do it for him down there anymore. So I ain't driving to West Virginia to do it. So you, you better you better get some. I'll tell you what, when I send your freaks order, I'll throw you I'll throw you a few more pH kits in there just to get you to do it. Sorry, sorry, it's so quiet here, guys. It's just a lot of stuff going on here. A lot of people asking stuff, and I see a lot of you guys are answering. I appreciate my pro staff guys for coming on board and, and doing their job here and taking care of a lot of this. Bradley, I appreciate you just ordering one. That, that's great, man. You have any questions, you just message me, bud. I'll I'll help you out in any way I can. Doug, you're asking where where do you use TDM at? I'm I'm thinking you're talking about our trophy deer mineral. Uh, if you're looking at trophy deer mineral, I'm finding that place that's more of a sanctuary. And if it's not a sanctuary yet, I want it to be one. So I'm going to get that that mineral lick somewhere on my farm. That especially now with cell cameras, I don't have to disturb it. I want them deer to feel safe when they're in it. I want it away from a road away from any kind of anything going on i want them to be able to walk in there and know they're safe they can they can be in there for hours at a time i kind of like higher ground myself i like a higher ground but i want a flat i don't want something that you're gonna get a bunch of rain and you know how they're gonna dig a hole it'll get water in it i don't want it all running over running down the hillsides and down into the creek stuff i don't want that i want a good flat usually in a pretty thick area and then the deer will thin the area out for you and they just have trails going everywhere but when i'm using my trophy deer mineral um, a lot of guys use a lot more than they need to uh, i don't know if they just if they don't understand how it works or if they just feel better doing it more power to them use all you want it's not going to hurt nothing the deer will only benefit from it uh, but i will use a 20 pound bag uh, i already Freshen my sights up in Indiana. I can't use it here in Illinois, which is, a, you know, I don't even want to get into that. Um, but the Indiana farm, I use, I use one, one 20 pound bag of our trophy mineral, which that one 20 pound bag is actually made to build four lick sites, five pounds a piece. That's how we got that mix in the power rack with it to sweeten it up a little bit more. Best of both worlds. I go in there and I use this one 20 pound bag in the spring. I'll go back in about June, put one more 20 pound bag in it. It will dissolve down into the soil, just like it's supposed to. The deer intake it in through the soil. Uh, that's why they dig the hole, they dig it up, they eat the soil. Uh, so that's how I do mine. So if you've got a big number of deer, yeah, you might want to add a, a third bag there somewhere, but two has always worked great for me and, and over the Usually when it comes to deer mineral, and a lot of people think it's overnight success, which it is not, I will see a big difference in my deer herd on a new property within usually the, really getting into that third year, that that next generation of deer coming in, you'll start really seeing it then. 
I don't care what you put out there. You're not going to put something out there and they're going to grow 60 inches overnight. They're, they're not going to do it. So I'm looking, when I use my deer mineral, I'm looking for number one, the healthiest of my deer. Herd. I want them as healthy as they can be. I want my fawns up and healthy, uh, good milk production. I, I want it all. So bigger the bigger the horns afterwards, awesome. But I want my herd healthy. It takes a healthy deer to grow big horns. So that's why I use it. And I'd give anything in this world if I could use it in Illinois. Greg, I touched on this a minute ago. I don't know if you heard or not, but you're asking what the recommended weed killer is to use on clover plots. The chemical 2,4-DB, that is 2,4-D as in dog, B as in boy. Uh, make sure it has that B in the boy, B as in boy on the end of it. If it does not, it will kill the plot. So 2,4-DB uh, for the broadleaf control and then clethodem for the grass control. Mark talking about how he loves spending time in the woods and creating new plots and maintain them. I hear you, buddy. There's nothing like it. Old Darren's on here. Darren, man, I, I... Oh, where'd you go? It's good to see you on here, bud. We get to talk to you every once in a while on uh, Messenger. I forgot where you just went. I know you're using you're using a feeder, uh, you're using a rack maker a lot, or a trophy deer, uh, deer and elk pellets. I appreciate that, buddy. And I'm I'm glad to see you on here, man. Hope you're doing good. Hope your family's doing good. So we'll be talking probably soon again when you place your next order. I know you always message us on uh, Messenger. So I appreciate that. You've been a long time customer of ours. Mark actually is on here, and I, I think I, I know I've already touched on this, but maybe Mark, you missed it, or uh, or maybe you put this before I before I even said it. But he's asked me if I could explain the pH kit uh, again on a plot. I'll take all four corners, just just a little garden shovel or a little plug tool, all four corners, one in the center. Um, I will put them in my little bucket, stir them all up, and it takes eight ounces of that soil and eight ounces of distilled water. You mix it up, let it set for 10 minutes, rip your strip off, stick your strip in, pull it out, shake it off. You really want to, there's a color chart in this kit that is going, you're gonna line it up with, and that's gonna tell you your pH, excuse me. You really wanna do that as soon as possible. You don't wanna throw it down there on the gator or the ranger there for 10 minutes or so because the pH of the atmosphere will actually change it. So you want to go and just kind of wipe it off while it's still wet, hold it up there, see what it is, and boom, that's what you got. So then you go from your chart to see you're at a 5.5 pH. So you're going to look over here and you're wanting to go to 7.0. So you're going to be here. You follow it down. It's going to tell you how many uh, tons of lime. This kit, now actually that is something good here. This kit was going to tell you the tonnage of lime you're going to need. It is based on ag lime. When you're using pelleted lime, it's only one tenth of the amount. So don't get scared when you see that big number thinking you got to. And I actually just had a gentleman and man, I felt bad for him. Uh, call me the other day and told me he just got done putting his lime out. And he, he told me how, how took 4,000 pounds of it and it just going crazy. And what he ended up doing was uh, uh, had a co-op test it. And he got the test back and the guy from the co-op told him he needed 4,000 pounds of lime. Well, he didn't know there was a difference between ag lime and pelleted lime. So he went to Real King and bought 4,000 pounds of pelleted lime and spread it on this acre plot, which is just, oh my, it was ungodly. So he only needed 400 pounds and he put 4,000 on it. 
I felt so bad for him. So we're working together, try to see if we can get that all straightened out for him and uh, wait for another call back from him. And man, I, I hated that for him. Mark, I hope that explains what I was on that pH kit. Pretty self explanatory. I can say everything's right there in it. Tells you all about it. Don, you can keep that two foot of snow up there. I don't want it. Wallace Gibson, good to see you on here, bud. Scuba, you're always wanting some kind of new swag. I'm telling you, now it's a stretch fit hat. Come on. Unless you're talking about me bragging about how Keaton talks about me. My own pro staff won't even talk to me like that. Has to be a good friend, I'll tell you. See how I rate with you guys. Uh, Mark Coleman, how long will the will the mix of trophy hold on a minute? Will the mix of clover fuel stay good in your sprayer? Or should you empty your sprayer after it? I empty it after every application, especially plot max. Uh, you definitely want to do that. That you don't want any of that fertilizer in there. It's even though them them tanks, a lot of them are Roundup ready and and the glyphosate ready stuff like that. They will still eat on them. You know, so the your pickup tube, your your filter, all that stuff. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I will never put a sprayer away without running clear water through it after I get done dumping it out. If I didn't get it all used, I'll dump it out. I'll put some fresh water in it, just enough to clear all that, all of it out of my hoses and my nozzles, and then then I'll dump that fresh water the rest of the way out. I always like keeping mine clean. I don't want nothing left in them. Now, I get, I guess I just lied to you a little bit because I do use our jolt fertilizer on our garden, and I got it in a two-gallon pump-up sprayer. So not much air for it to tear up, you know, it's a little handheld sprayer. But uh, if you're asking if it's going to go bad or not, no, it's not going to go bad. Uh, but in something with electric pump on it, I would I would run it through and be done. But the handheld sprayer, stuff like that, you're, you're good to go. Long as you don't let it freeze. You never, and even like one of these bottles, if they freeze, they're going to start losing. So you want to keep them from freezing through the winter. If you ever buy some and store them, uh, all mine are down here in the basement. I keep them all in the basement because I know it's heated and air conditioned. Uh, that's where all mine are at year round. I figured he was, Steve. In scuba. I know how you are. Well, guys, it's about that time. I'll tell you what, I really, really appreciate everybody jumping on here tonight. The very first one got a lot of good topics coming on. Uh, every two weeks, the topic list is already made, sent over to the marketing group. Marketing group, they're taking care of all that for me for the graphics. It's working out really well. Uh, pretty excited over it. Got some good guests coming in uh, and maybe some surprise guests that will pop up like the day of the show going to air you might find on there. So, uh, you know, with all the hunting seasons, a lot of people want to know who I'm going to have on here and when I'm going to have them on. But when you got turkey season going on, shed hunting, food plots going in, a lot of our, our TV personality stuff like that, they're swamped. You know, they're busy. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. They, they'll jump off to help me out if I really, really need it. Uh, but I'm going to try my best to get you guys some good ones on there and uh, so you can look at something more than just me. But uh, I appreciate it all, guys. Scuba Steve, yes, I will see you this weekend, bud. I appreciate it. You call me boss. I, I'll tell you what. I'll buy, your, I'll buy your dinner for that one. So, But you guys have any questions, like always, feel free to call me. Out my number is 217-621-3289. 217-621-3289. You all know it. Call me. Give it to your buddies. Uh, I don't work a nine to five. My phone is on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You have an issue, call me. So email me, text me. I'll help you in any way I can. 
Uh, it don't have to be about buying something. You just need help getting it planted, something like that. I'll help you in any way I can to, to give you the information that'll help you out. So you guys have a great night. You take care and we'll see you here in a couple of weeks.